have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to meet with alumni. Thank you, Hillary, and uh, welcome everyone. Even though I can't see all your faces, I can. I know. I know your names because Hillary sent me the list yesterday, and I thought, oh, this feels like many old friends and in the room, and others that I have not yet met. So uh, I'm always delighted to talk to speak with alumni, and and also I just want to let everybody know that we've invited faculty emeriti to this call as well. For those of you who made the track and the journey to winter session in Santa Barbara in January. Some of you may have had the opportunity to see some of our wonderful retired faculty and have a chance to interact with them. Well, as you know, uh, for those of you who attend these fairly regularly, we've been doing an annual webinar series of, with many other speakers than just the president, but I at least try to do three a year, and the first one of every year is really the state of the university. So this is a little bit of a lifting up the hood, looking under the covers and seeing how are things going at the institution. So it's not the, the um, high level sort of what you read in Focus Magazine, it's more like, you know, what, what are we doing every day in terms of our work and what are the directions of fielding in this year and coming up for this year. So first I wanna do just a quick sound check. Hillary, can you hear me fine? I can hear you just great. Thank you. Right. I always like to check just in case, and uh, we will be monitoring chat as well in case something changes with the volume. So Hillary, we can go to the next slide. I have about a dozen slides here, and they I will do my best not to just read them, and also they will be available as part of a PowerPoint if you want to look at them. So Fielding's vision hasn't changed, essentially, in the last 15 years. I would say that we have gone through different cycles of understanding our vision differently, but in fact, since 1974, we were founded to be a, uh, a self-reflective relational learning environment for quality graduate education delivered in a very different way. And it's part of those differences many of you experience, should have experienced over your time as fielding students and now as graduates. And, and all of that, all of these differences are embedded and encapsulated in the vision. So the notion that fielding is, is a community that's always looking into the new, a community that is not bounded I'm um, not even sure we like the term global, although galactic didn't make a lot of sense. But the notion that we are a community that wherever a few of us are gathered, we, we become fielding. So this notion that we're a university without walls. And that we're really dedicated to this educational mission of scholar practitioners, developing leaders, all in the pursuit of, of making a positive social difference, you might call it, or in pursuit of justice and sustainability, of creating a more humane world. And I added something at the bottom of the slide because I think it's really important that we acknowledge that part of the doctoral enterprise at Fielding is a little different from the master's and certificate programs, although all are critical for different reasons, but the doctoral enterprise is really about this new knowledge creation. And Fielding's uh, slice of the world or take on this is that we're creating new knowledge specifically for practical application. We go out there with the skill sets and the ideas that we can actually put into practice and then bring back, as faculty like Barbara Mink and Keith Melville talk about in the, in the HOD programs, to bring back what we learn from practice, it, practice into research and theory. And all of this requires certain skills. And those of you who've been graduated a while and, and are uh, far along in your careers can think about these skills now. Think about staff that you've worked with. Think about your own life. You know, the skills for how do you empower yourself? How do you, you create your own agency? How do you um, develop a cognitive complexity so you see the world in more complex ways? How do we become more agile thinkers that, is a bill, uh, that we're able to adapt to rapidly changing circumstances? How do we practice compassion, a kind of empathetic compassion for, for all, which allows us to negotiate across difference? And how is it that we build self-reflection? That really embodies the fielding learning model. Let me go to the next slide. So this is uh, 
uh, funny, Hillary, on my screen, the the slides are not coming in very well. I mean, they're they're fine. We can make it happen, but it looks like there's a little bit of a. Does it look fuzzy? Yeah. No. Um, if there, the, there you go. Whatever you just did. <laughs> oh, I think I maybe had your image over the text. So sorry about that. Is that better, everyone? No problem. Okay. okay. Thank you. So our strategy is very simple. We're we have a three-part strategy which we resource in the budget every year. And it's tied to the strategic plan, which is we want to really focus on our existing programs. What are the programs that uh, we're that are growing? What are the programs that are steady state, and we need to make sure they, you know, they're a resource? And what are the programs that may be struggling? What are we going to do about that? What kinds of assessments and support do they need? So with existing programs, the programs that are growing, uh, namely right now, though this changes from year to year, but right now our media psychology program is growing in terms of the number of students and also building the brand. You may remember that media psychology, we were the first institution in the country to have a doctoral program in media psychology. And the very fact that we created it meant that it that although it is very, it's a really exciting program, there is not necessarily an understanding with prospective students as to what media psychology truly is. And of course, for those of you who may have graduated from the program, simply put, it is the influence of media on behavior and vice versa, although it's you know much deeper and richer than that. But media psychology is gaining a lot of ground in the marketplace. Another place where we're seeing growing interest it, with prospective students is in our coaching programs. And, a, and, and the programs that are uh, steady state be our clinical psychology program, always a very popular program, uh, high quality like all of them. And our uh, organizational, our HOD programs are doing very well also. The program that's having the most difficulty is our EDD program. So one of the things we're saying is, okay, let's do an assessment and figure out What's happening? What's changing in the environment? What are our prospective students telling us? The second uh, strategy is what's new? Um, you know, fielding went through a period actually where we didn't build new programs. Um, who knows why? But we're realizing that 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 isn't enough. You know, that fielding doesn't isn't meant to be big. We don't want to be big. We want to really be able to be a deep deep learning institution, not a broad learning institution. But when you think about it, there are certain programs that we could offer that would really allow us to create a whole new generation of students in particular subject areas that would benefit from the fielding learning model, what I just talked about before, that fielding vision. So I'll come back to some of those programs that we've developed. And then last, what do we do next? I mean, this idea about being an innovative community, well, we need to have space in an organization to discuss that, to it, whatever you call it, the, the blue sky, the ocean, the, the uh, skunk works, the, you know, whatever that container is, you need a play, an innovation lab, you need a place for a conversation. And that's one of the things that we're trying to set aside. And that takes some resources to do. Who's in that conversation? How did, how what are the faculty talking about? What's, you know, what's exciting? Um, some things that are coming out of fielding right now are things in data science around, uh, the humanistic aspects of of, um, of data. You know, what role might we play in educating people who get into data and do the coding about building codes that may uh, un have unintended consequences in terms of discrimination? Maybe there's something there, so faculty are talking about that. Other things, uh, artificial intelligence. What are the implications of artificial intelligence on learning and education and teaching? So it's that kind of these kinds of conversations. And I see um, Craig wrote something about um, a teaching track for clinical psychology. Yeah, that's the kind of thing we should be thinking about. And we're adding more CEUs this year for clinical psychology graduates, which is, is so important for them. Uh, Cloud just wrote about artificial intelligence and ethics. Definitely. And what are the ethical implications of the way we use data? We're not science. We're not scientists or mathematicians, but we are social scientists. So always bringing that social systemic perspective to what's happening now in our society. Hillary, if you could go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. So there are a couple of just breaks in here. 
So I really talked about this already in terms of the, the programs. So if we could go to the current programs, all of which you guys know about. Uh, Hillary, if you could go to the next slide. And so it's happening again, a little bit of a cutting off on the left side there. There we go. I think it's the transition just takes a little bit of time. How does that look? That's good now, thank you. So in terms of academic accomplishments, some of these have been ongoing. So as you know, we formed the New School of Leadership Studies and that was really an attempt to do the second thing. One was to, to frame us more broadly as an institution around this notion of leadership, which was more, more well understood by those outside the institution as opposed to say scholar practitioner or human and organization development or educational leadership for change. Also, it was to create a common doctoral framework so that students in a number of programs could go back and forth through the programs, across the programs more easily, take courses from faculty, have other faculty serve on their committees and so on. Um, this has been really important because this is what we heard from students that they wanted more of, more access. Um, it's a little different in clinical psychology because there are more requirements for them around their clinical training. We also hired new faculty, and those of you who may know about the, the have, may have met some of the new faculty, uh, they are amazing, just like our current faculty. It's just wonderful to see. We hired five new faculty in HOD, in the HOD programs, and we'll be hiring, I think, one or two more for next year. Um, so that's, that's good. Uh, we we're implementing new shared con concentrations. I just listed a few here, but there are many more in media psychology and education and in HOD programs. We launched a post back in clinical psychology and we're working on a prior learning assessment a pilot for the EDD program and, and now the HOD programs. And the reason that's important is that prior learning, uh, which is something that we've, we've done informally, but to formalize that, uh, we're working with another organization to build our own uh, way of doing it uh, will allow us to uh, hopefully our intention is is to also start a what you might call an all but dissertation program or a dissertation completion program you know as you know not at fielding but in other graduate institutions 90% of the dropout rate for doctoral candidates is at dissertation that's the opposite for fielding. If we get you as far as dissertation, you're going to finish. Uh, that probably has to do with the support structure we put around people at the committee level. And what we're thinking of doing is offering a, a dissertation completion program for people who get that far but don't quite finish it. If you go to the next slide. Uh, other things we've done, I'll just let you read this. So. Um, probably the, I mean, all of these are important. Our APA accreditation is important in general as far as our reputation for quality, uh, partnership. We've just offered our first academy. It's happening right now. Um, and our Navajo Nation partnership is doing very well. We'll be having, I think, uh, almost 20 students come in to the program in May. I'll go to the next slide. So administration, you know, we just have to, like all organizations, continue to do the things that need to be done to improve. So you may have noticed our new website, which is constantly, we're engaging it and refining it all the time and working how to make it. It's our, it's our biggest front face. So how do we really make it fielding and not, not generic? You know, how do you make it really distinctively ourselves? Um, We've, we've moved around our marketing emissions to be closer to our academics, which has helped. And we've had growing enrollments in various places. And as you can see, reverse declining enrollments in our HOD programs. Uh, we're, we have a strategic plan and an inclusion plan, and we've launched our inclusion console collaborative. Some of you may be on it. And I wanna thank you uh, for your service there. I think that's a really important initiative for us. Uh, it is timely and it is critical for our future and for our sustainability in terms of really being able to enter into conversations in a competent way about what does it mean to be an increasingly diverse society that's striving for inclusion. 
Uh, and then implementing our external strategy. We have uh, partnerships now with various universities. Last time I did this call, I had a follow-up with an alum who suggested that I meet with another institution, and we did. I mean, not all conversations lead to partnerships, but every conversation is an opportunity for me to go out there and represent Fielding, represent you. And I think that's, that's critical for just making sure that fielding is seen and heard in lots of different spaces. So if you have other relationships where you think it might be worth an exploration, do let us know, put it in the chat. We'll go to the next slide, Hillary. So now this is creating new programs. So I feel like I get to do the big curtain. Go to the next slide, please. And you can see the new things that we've done. Oh, in the next one, thank you. So we redesigned a master's program in digital teaching and learning. It was a, originally a ge general ed, a master's of ed degree, and we thought, you know, we have a lot of talent in the digital realm and in particularly in our media psych and our educational school, so let's focus on digital teaching and learning, the master's level. Um, a number of our faculty in our organization development leadership program have this expertise now. So we've redesigned it and we have uh, relaunched that. Uh, we created a master's in infant and early childhood development, and I don't think I mentioned, but we had a few years ago acquired a doctoral program in infant and early childhood development, which is growing. And this is a really important program. It's a focus on developmental disorders, so across the autism spectrum. And there's two specific tracks, an infant mental health and neurodevelopment. And this is a critical need in society. This is a really good example of the faculty saying, what is it that Fielding needs to do now to be part of critical, important conversations in society in the future? A, I think it's a true, true win. Um, and then I mentioned the doctoral completion program. You can go to the next slide. We have just gotten approval from WASC for uh, two other master's programs, one in mental health counseling and supervision, and that has two tracks, American, African American mental health and Latino mental health. And we're going to focus those master's programs uh, because they have clinical components, so we need to focus them a, a little bit on the ground in the Washington corridor, that Washington DC slash to New York corridor, and also in Southern California. So building partnerships with universities and, and clinics where we can actually offer some of that work on the ground. And then we have a master's in couples, the old marriage family therapy, but now couples marriage family therapy, something we should have done years ago because we have lots of expertise in this, which tracks in African-American families, Latino families, LGBTQ families, and medical service families. And for those of you who may not know what medical service families, those are families that uh, have to cope with chronic illness over time. Uh, next slide. In addition, our intention is, is to offer, uh, we're thinking, we're looking ahead to maybe applied mathematics and data analytics. Um, Claude mentioned AI and ethics. We're thinking about we need to partner with an institution that could offer the math part, but could we offer the data analytics as it relates to, to sort of human human engagement, societal issues. Not sure yet, still that's very speculative. Uh, also looking at applied behavior analysis, which is less speculative, much more straightforward. We'll be adding PhDs to counseling and supervision and couples and family therapy in the, in the future years. Um, also what's recently come up is art therapy uh, from the faculty. There's been some discussion about whether we should offer that. Uh, so there's, there's ideas that are still around, and that's good. That means that they're in the air, there's a lot of energy for them, and we can start thinking about them, in, but think about them in strategic ways. You know, not every idea, all ideas may be good ideas, but not every idea is right for us, right, or right for us at this time, or right for our own thinking um, in terms of what we think our vision is. So Hillary, the next slide. Uh, some of you know, since some of you are in the area, that in 2014, uh, 14 slash 2015, we started a Washington DC office 
and we are, it's doing very, very well. We've been able to have partnerships with the University of District Columbia. We started an initiative with historically black colleges and universities, our HBCU initiative, and that's an initiative of two types. One is, for example, with the University of District Columbia, we have, we're working on a, a doctoral degree program together. It's a, it'll be a joint program launched in September. And it'll be housed at UDC, but we will provide, we're providing faculty expertise in how do you craft a doctoral program, how do you create the competencies, how do you work with the students, and it, it's in urban leadership and entrepreneurship. So it's a very exciting program. And that's an example of the kind of partnering that we do. Another is to offer, uh, with the University of Virgin Islands, we're offering a track in organizational development and leadership and change because they don't have the expertise in that, but they have a doctorate that they just launched in creative leadership, and we provide a track for that. So we get some of their students for a period of time, a year, a year, a year and a half, and, and they go through our particular track. So it's another way to partner with institutions. It's really good for other students from other universities to get to know us. It's also good for our faculty to work with other faculty, and it keeps enriching our ideas, right? We want, you have to keep energizing yourself and look, look outside our own frame. It helps us uh, do more experiential kinds of learning. Next slide. So we've, we've done a, a great job with our research. We've raised money um, for it, and we've been able to, as a result, take other monies that were set aside for things and, and use that to help fund more student research, more faculty research. And that's really important, more professional development, especially I noticed in the track, uh, I haven't really read it because I'm speaking, but in the track, the comments, um, this idea about having a teaching track, you know, part of it is, is it would help us if we could we had more funds to support students while they're here, not only to write papers and go to conferences, but also to do some teaching. Some of our programs are doing that more than others, like Media Psychology is doing that because they've gotten a lot of um, requests from students to build up their teaching experience before they graduate. But I think it's a really important strategic issue for us, and I can hear that, and I can see that in the chat from, uh, from you all. Uh, we are on, on track. We are a finalist for a $9 million grant for leadership development for women in the STEM professions. This is super exciting. We'll know in, I think they are actually reading our proposal on um, Valentine's Day, and then we'll know if we get invited for a site visit. So that's, that's insider information. And if we get invited to a site visit we, in April, then we're almost certainly a issue in. So. Um, Cross your fingers for fielding. It's all good for us. The, the more your alma mater does in the world, and the better, the better for all of us. Um, grant funds, as I said, I just said all that. Go ahead. They free up money for other things. Um, one of our strategies is, tier, I, I mentioned the third one, is what do we do next, right? And I don't really have a lot to say here. This is, I, as I said, it's really more about creating that space. And what I'm trying to do as a president is make sure that this is kept alive, right? Let's keep talking. Let's keep thinking. Let's keep um, having the kinds of dialogue and conversation that are inspiring, challenging, keep moving the institution along. So we want to keep the pot boiling, not in a negative way, but in a, in a productive way. So one of the things we did is we created a little innovation team, and, and anybody can run an idea by them. We're reviewing potential new programs. Another thing that we've done is at the, at the trustee level, we created a subcommittee to review educational trends. So what's happening out there, let's bring it back here. A lot of this work is conducted informally or had been in the past, so I wanted to make it more intentional, like let's create a committee, let's have regular review, let's make sure we're sharing and communicating. I mean, as part of this, even though it may seem like an aside, I do a weekly video informal to staff and, and faculty, and the reason is, is it's another communications vehicle, right? Let's, let's keep talking about what's going on out there, what's in the field, what are the trends that we're seeing, particularly in graduate education. And, and as, you know, as you know, it's been a tough couple of years 
and I don't just mean that financially. I think sort of socially in our society, it's it's uh, there's more and more people questioning the value of the higher of higher education, and so we have to be really aware of that as as educators ourselves, and what does that mean for our sector and for our students? Not to mention things like uh, tuition, debt burden, all of that. The next slide. So what's going on in the alumni space? Well, as many of you know, we have had a, uh, I mean, we've just really taken off in terms of all of our alumni activities and all of your engagement. And I mean, just to give you an example, in terms of in-person events in 2013, we held four. Last year, we held 39. Um, I mean, Hillary is a, a, a dynamo and we have a great unit. And, and as president, I'm really committed to getting on the road and visiting with all of you as much as I can. And I don't get around nearly as much as I'd like to. Just not enough, not enough time in the, in the calendar, in the year. But I think it shows that more and more graduates are showing up, not, not just to see Hillary or me, but to be together and to do work together. Our virtual webinars also have, uh, have um, gone up, been better attended, more interest. Uh, more presenters and I think the reason for that is um, is that we you know we feature we try to get the word out more quickly and more in advance which is something that you alumni told us to do uh, we're trying to collaborate more with the programs about webinars and we think that that will improve the the um, the number of offerings that we can you know reasonably implement particularly if the programs are with us and then lastly, uh, as, as I mentioned, the Inclusion Council, uh, we thought, well, we'll put it out there, see how many people want to um, be part of the Inclusion Council. And we had, we had 65 applications, um, almost all of them from alumni. So people are really interested in doing real work, not just hanging around, having a glass of wine, that's fine. But I think in, in really doing the kind of work that inspired them, inspired you when you were at Fielding, you want, you want to not only give back to your institution, but in a meaningful, thoughtful way. And I think one of the things that keeps me at Fielding when I came in the faculty 13 years ago and then became president four years ago is that there aren't many spaces in our lives. If you go away from Fielding, you realize that most spaces don't have the kind of enriching conversations and engagement with each other that you can have at Fielding. And it's those enriching conversations that are meaningful and that add so much to our own lives. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, I wanted to just spend a minute on the role of trustees. I, I don't think I need to read this, but sometimes people ask me about the trustees. So I like to just so this is the second to last slide, I promise. So I like to ask, you know, remind people that what trustees do, and one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up in this particular conversation is because uh, half of our board are comprised of alumni. Uh, we have an open, they're public trustees, but we have an open recruiting process at the board level uh, for trustees, for alumni. And although they haven't recruited in the last couple of months because they're doing some of their own um, strategic reflection and work, um, it's important for you to know because I think some of you may someday want to serve on the board. And this is what they do. They really look around. Are we, what are they, they don't do the work, but they ensure that we are. So they ask us the compelling and powerful questions around innovating our model, around our student learning and their outcomes. Are we really implementing our strategic plans? What can we do by way of improving our processes? How can we focus on increasing our, diversifying our revenues so we can keep our tuition prices low? And then of course the reaffirmation. So that WASC and APA, that WASC stands for Western Schools of Colleges and Universities Commission. Commission. <laughs> and they, um, they are our regional accreditors. One last slide. The next presence webinar is April 18th from 1 to 2. And if you wanted me to discuss a particular topic, anything that you've heard today, or something that might be exciting, or something more general like higher ed trends, or what does fielding think about, or you know anything that you'd like me to do to discuss that you think would be of interest, just put it in the chat box 
and uh, I'll take it under advisement because I'm always looking for good topics. So that's it. Um, Hillary, I will turn it over to you and, and we can conduct a chat or you can have people raise their hands or however you'd like to run the process. Thanks for listening, everyone. Perfect. I will uh, go ahead and try out this uh, virtual raising of the hands. And it looks like uh, Becky Reese was the very first one. So uh, Becky, I'm going to go ahead and click on yours and you should be able to talk. Okay. Um, yeah, I am very interested in the Experiential Learning Academy and um, you mentioned it briefly, but I don't know what the PLA is and I'm interested in knowing more. Sure. Thanks, Becky. Good to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Prior, yeah, PLA stands for Prior Learning Assessment, and it was something that it was invented decades ago. It's not really new, but the simple notion is that a person who's particularly mid-career, someone who's have you know, 10, 20 years of experience under their belt, comes into a program and says, well, I don't have formal learning, but I have a lot of prior learning. Uh, I, you know, I was um, C-suite or I was a middle manager or I did this work and I know how to do this and I worked in organizational change or I was in HR or, and, and the idea is how does an institution uh, take that uh, learning from a person and evaluate it and say, well, this constitute this amount of graduate level learning that we can apply in advance, prior learning assessment, and an application to your doctoral program. Works, works better usually at the doctoral level. So the question is, that person has to build a portfolio. So there's a couple of different methods, and the method that Fielding is using is we create a faculty assessment committee, so assessment committee with a group, small group of faculty who've been trained in assessment, and the student goes through a course called Prior Learning Assessment Course, and in that course, which is about 10 to 12 weeks long, the faculty work closely with them to build their prior learning portfolio. And then the portfolio is evaluated by another panel with the registrar to determine what transferable credits there are. Now, that may sound complicated, but for someone who has come into the program and may have significant prior learning, it can accelerate their time to graduation. At the same time, we want to make sure that this is a, a high quality and consistent assessment method and approach. So it takes time to build the framework because the faculty have to come to some agreement about the parameters and there are methods and approaches to doing that. So Becky, I hope that helped answer your question. And I can send you the agenda for the for Prior Learning Academy that we're involved in right now. So that is the same thing then as the Experiential Learning Academy? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Great. And we'll go. Uh, thank you, Becky. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to the next person with their digital hand raised, and that is Kathleen Long. I'll go ahead and turn on your sound. Just make sure that you're unmuted. Kathleen, uh, it might be a technical difficulty on my end here, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and move on to uh, Gigi and let me see if I'm able to uh, change that. Can you hear me? Oh, Kathleen, I can hear you now. Sorry, Gigi, I'll be right back. Okay. Go ahead, Kathleen. And it looks like there might be unmuted again. Uh, Gigi, we'll just go ahead and back to you. Okay. And we'll be back with you in a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, just a couple of questions. Thank you very much for sharing all this great stuff. Um, just a few things, wanting to know what's happening and things like how is ISI doing? Um, a couple of years ago, there was talk about having a leadership entity that was going to do exec ed and consulting. And I want to hear more on the women in STEM leadership. Great. Hi, Gigi. Happy to tell you about all those things. So Institute for Social Innovation is doing very well. 
we got a shot in the arm when we had a, um, a donation of a quarter of a million dollars as an endowment to the Institute for Social Innovation, which allows us to use the proceeds from that endowment so it has to be invested. So just this year, we're going to be able to start using the proceeds to fund uh, our, our ISI uh, program for it will still be modest amounts for in the next couple of years, but then it will accrue um, to be able to fund work in social innovation. So that's exciting. Charles McClintock is still leading that program and our ISI fellows programs going well. We had a great workshop session at winter session. Uh, I think every year we're sort of improving our ways and means that we engage our ISI fellows. So um, Katie McGraw now, who's a, uh, director of our research sponsored programs is now able to offer technical support to alumni for things like grant writing and and helping them find grants to apply for and then helping alumni through the process of grant writing so that's been really important and that's also under the Institute for Social Innovation so that was very exciting um, and, and I, I think that is going really well our we were going to build a fielding leadership Academy and simply because of other priorities, we wanted to have a, an, a writing center for students first and a professional development center is next up because we want to really uh, have something to offer alumni and students regarding ongoing career services. We're, we've put the Fielding Leadership Academy off a little bit, so what we decided to do is under the Institute for Social Innovation, we are working on a contract possibilities with alumni who are interested to be able to offer credits to any of the consultancies that they're engaged in so it's not quite like executive uh, education but it's it's a little bit it's more like a, supporting our alumni to do executive education if they're interested and will be the will be the institution that that provides the continuing education units or the credits for that we're working right now on one that's pretty exciting um, with Apple China and a, a, an alumna who is working with the company to do that. So that's the way that we're doing executive education. And the third thing you asked about was the, the women in leadership development for STEM. So the, our argument has been, and we've just wrote a great book called Women Called to Lead. Um, and we, we said, okay, what can we're fielding would like to engage in, in, in social justice directly, not just indirectly. And what's a pressing need in, in, grad, in higher education? Well, one of the things are the ways that women hit glass ceilings in higher education. And particularly women of color, particularly women of color in the STEM profession. So we, we took that sort of distilled down to what could we really have impact on? And we went to the National Science Foundation and said, we could, what we're good at is leadership development. Let's partner with another institution. So we partnered with the American Association of Colleges and Universities. Let's partner with them and build a leadership development academy for women in STEM professions so that they learn the skills and they understand the dynamics and they can overcome those dynamics to help them succeed in leadership positions. And then we collected the data, so we've been doing this for three years now, this is our third cycle. And then we've been watching, of course, how this, the women who go through this academy, it's, a, it's three face-to-face -face sessions a year, how they go through the academy and then see how they, you know, are they promoted, do they go on to better jobs, et cetera. And what we're seeing, of course, it's still, only a few years, but what we're seeing is, yes, these women are ascending to leadership positions more quickly and with more adeptness. So that, that shows that this model is working. So predicated on that, even though it was early data, we went back to NSF and said, we'd like to apply for a full grant, and that's why we're a finalist on that, that grant. So that grant, that would be the biggest grant feeling ever received, to be part of a $9 million grant, and we wouldn't get all the money because we have partners, but the idea would be is it's housed, we build virtually something called the Center for the Advancement of STEM Leadership, or CASEL. And the idea is that we would, we would provide the curriculum and the leadership development piece. There's also a research piece and evaluation piece and so on. And if you're really interested, Judy, you can, you can write me and I'll send you the, the, de, the project description because it is pretty interesting if you're, if you're interested in that kind of work. 
Great, thank you so much. And uh, Katrina, it looks like there's a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Yeah, I have a question for Julie. Great. So Julie, you, and I wanna answer the question about the fires too, but Julie, you asked a question about um, alumni engagement with students. Can you refresh my memory on that? Because we are just organizing summer session right now. So this is a timely question. And it looks like I was trying to get Julie um, on audio here, but it looks like the, uh, the version right now is not supporting um, okay. sound for her. So uh, Julie, please feel free to go ahead and put, maybe expand a little bit more in the chat box or in the Q&A, and we can certainly come back to that piece. Yeah, I think that, and Betty mentioned something too. This was, oh, oh thank you, Betty. I appreciate your comment. I, I misunderstood it initially. Um, yeah, Julie says she can't unmute herself, so I'm not sure. Maybe you have to, maybe you, she has to come up on our screen here or something. But here's what I understand, Julie, is that the alumni might want to offer a workshop on session about proofreading a dissertation or how to pick a dissertation committee. I think that's a great idea. And Hillary, why don't we confer on that? Because we'd like maybe we should get that into the program's thinking now. Certainly sounds good. Mm -hmm. Then there was another question in the Q&A coming from Bill, and, uh, and, and you have answered this in part, but his question is, how do you see the doctoral completion program working within Fielding's unique culture? Yeah, great question, Bill. That's actually one of the big questions, right? Um, well, we've, we've experimented with it. We've had uh, three students over the last 18 months who've come in. We had somebody that had a PhD, had an EDD, and wanted to get a PhD in the HOD program. So we, um, so we fa fast-tracked his, his uh, application, and we, you know, we experimented a bit because we thought, well, this would be a good test case. And one of the big questions that came up is, well, how is a person acculturated to fielding? And, and what's a fielding degree? You know, if somebody comes in and writes a dissertation, that's not really the fielding, the whole fielding learning model. So one of the things that, that the faculty decided is that, uh, first of all, the importance of having not just a, uh, yes, a mentor, but also another support person, either um, another student or another faculty member that, that uh, provides a broader a broader and deeper support for that person that student so that means it's it's more time consuming to do the other thing is to make, have that person go through our new student orientation and to go through we have a, a new thing we call now either it's the the pre new student orientation online which then allows you to be in community with someone. So to require that no matter what, and also require no matter what, now you know that in some programs this is not required, but in this, this doctoral completion program, the faculty want to require at least one face-to-face, -face, one national session that they have to commit to. And then we'll, we'll experiment, right? We'll see if that really is enough to, to be a true fielding educational experience. That's a great question, though. You really got to the heart of a, of a key problem. I wanted to also just talk a little bit about the fires because it came up. And um, I want to thank, it's way at the beginning, um, Andre, or Andrea, excuse me, sorry, um, about the fires. Thank you for asking that question. So Fielding's had a really tough time, um, honestly, in December. Uh, many of our staff were evacuated uh, all over the area from Ojai to Ventura, our faculty, alumni, some students. Um, some of us were voluntarily evacuated, myself, um, lots of other people that you may know or not know. And also we had a number of people taking care of elderly neighbors or Little, little ones or pets because other people had to evacuate. The air quality was so bad, a lot of people got sick or had to leave the area. And uh, we were, that was about two and a half weeks. Um, and miraculously, no one lost their home, although it was a very close thing for um, Patrice Rosenthal, Rich Applebaum on our faculty, um, and others, uh, Valerie Bentz, and almost lost their homes, but 
thankfully, uh, the firefighters did an amazing job. But it was very disruptive, as you can imagine how interesting it is to enact on our business continuity plan and our emergency preparedness uh, when the staff and, and the local faculty, students, and alumni are so affected and no one else is in our institution. So we felt um, a moral and ethical obligation and set of responsibilities to make sure that our our doors were open for our students and for our faculty so they could finish out their term, they could welcome new students, we could get ready for winter session. Finally, everybody got back in their homes around the 20th of December and then holidays. And then on January 6th, I think the second, the first night of the first part of winter session for the School of Leadership Studies, we had a heavy rain and a terrible mudslide with a loss of life in Montecito. So for those of you who know Fess Parker, which should be just about everybody, um, if you were at session and some of you were, you could see where the road was blocked off and you could see where um, you weren't allowed to go into that section of town. It was, you could see it from the Fess Parker, that's how close it was. So uh, 21 people died in that mudslide and um, it's still a terrible mess. The 101 was closed for two weeks. It opened uh, the day after we graduated our clinical psychology graduates. Um, despite that, people got here. Some of them went around, some of you went around between LA and Santa Barbara up the I-5. It took you five hours, six hours to get here. Um, it was normally a two hour trip. Um, others took the train, some people took a boat. Uh, it was a, again, miraculously, no one no one at Fielding were hurt, even though some of us were on the, we were divided for two weeks. Uh, we had to have some people work remotely. We had to do a lot of things to make sure that we could keep going. So it is truly a miracle that we, um, that twice, the Fielding community itself, uh, none of us were harmed. And, uh, but you know, I think that some of our staff are still feeling really stressed by the whole thing. I mean, Montecito may not be um, functional for many months. Uh, Casa de Maria, those of you who have been at Fielding a long time, and that used to be our home where we met, was uh, destroyed, although they will rebuild. Um, so it's been a hard time for everyone, I think, emotionally. So I appreciate you asking that question. However, we, we continue onward. Um, because time only flows in one direction. But I think it's also a reminder of how important it is to stay in community when things happen that are tragic and difficult. Because um, at the end of the day, we just have each other. Um, Julie asked about the Fielding University Press. And um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, she asked about uh, the topical monographs, as, as a student, she didn't really hear about it, and as alumni, you're not really hearing about it very much. You know, that's a really good question. I don't know to what extent Jean-Pierre Isbouts, who's our series editor uh, for the Fielding University Press, which was launched about three years ago, and we do monographs um, on topics, and we encourage alumni publishing, and now we're moving into uh, publishing books as well, um, because they, they give us more reach, uh, out there, we are using the. I use them a lot for promotional materials, so it gets your work out. Uh, we use, you know, there you were able to buy them on the internet and so on. So it's a good, it's a good thing to do if you've got a book or you want to write an article or an essay from your dissertation. But well, let me find out, Hillary. Do you know exactly how we reach out to students and alumni regarding the press? Sure. The, what I do know is that um, that Jean Pierre does lead that uh, initiative. And he, uh, in regards to sharing that out, typically that will go out in our news blogs and on social media, and then with the alumni newsletter, that it will also be on the alumni newsletter. But on our website, if you'd really like to take a look at all the monograph series, that's one of the best places to take a look. But this is actually a perfect transition to um, plug a uh, book launch that we are hosting up in Surrey. Um, we're going international, if you will, right across the border, uh, February 24th and 25th. And um, if anybody who's online, I have a little handout here. I'd be happy to share uh, with you information about that. But this is a Social Innovation Leadership Summit 
that really started um, around the promotion of the book um, uh, with uh, faculty member Valerie Bentz and faculty emeritus David Rohorik and several alumni authors. And the title of that book is Expressions of Phenomenological Research, Consciousness and Life World Studies. So these uh, monograph series are led by faculty and co-authored by alumni. And that is where the first uh, the stages really are on the Fielding Press in there. As of right now, really keeping it with the faculty leads on the discussion. So if, uh, the best way to find out more information about it is with uh, your direct contacts with faculty that you have relationships with to find out what their publishing schedule may be. And then Jean Care is also an excellent contact. And Katrina, you might have a little bit more to add to that. Yes, I'm actually putting it in the, the chat so people can see it. What's the, what are, what's the name of the event? Anyway, I know that I'm giving a presentation on social innovation. <laughs> and what I'm doing is I'm taking a, a, uh, an example from my community practice engagement when I worked in the nonprofit sector around uh, creating a multi-stakeholder engagement process to preserve a particular part of a community. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, about how social, so my basic theme is social innovation can be, can also be incremental, not, not simply a sort of a disruptive innovation, but it could be the, the long, slow work of building partnerships and relationships and coming to agreement on, on what a community wants to see for themselves in the future. And so I'll be talking about that. I know we have an alumnus there, um, Mike Wilson who has been instrumental with a nonprofit there called the Phoenix Society in building a homeless, um, facilities for homeless people who, who then transition to having their own home. So I think that's gonna be very important. Um, Hillary, again, what's the name of it? I'll put it in there. Sure, no problem. And I just put it in chat right now. It's called Social Innovation for Leadership in Work and Life. And uh, this is a two-day summit and all of the information is on our website. If you go to events, it is one of the featured uh, events. It's a free event. And if you're able to come, we would love to see you. Uh, and also on the call today, too, is the Northwest Hub, one of our uh, main leaders up there, Don Greenland, who is on the line. And day number two is really focused on alumni and student and faculty engagement and actual KA work. So we're really excited to have uh, kind of this newer model of regional events. And um, thank you, Don, for all of your incredible work and for all of the alumni uh, that will be presenting there as well. I also want to invite all of you, for those of you in the DC area, on March 6th from 3 to 5 p.m. and Washington, D.C. at the Cosmos Club. It's a hosted reception uh, with uh, Congressman Salud Carbajal, who is a congressman from Santa Barbara and a fielding alum, not alumnus, and he's going to talk about what's going on in Congress and also how his fielding education prepared him for the political work that he currently does. So I've just put that in the chat function as well. Uh, I want to go back to what Julie said because yes, I want to. I will follow. We'll follow up with Jean Pierre about making sure that students get more communications out about the press because I think it is a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great thing that we do here now and great added value. Uh, I think Shelly asked about data analytics resources as I looked up in the chat here. And I want to acknowledge that and I do have a, a good resource. So I'll tell you a little bit about the philosophy and one of the reasons why I'm so excited and engaged on it is that I am, um, I'm committed, and, and I'm, maybe I'm committable, but I'm committed to this notion that, that uh, society, we don't even understand the extent of the change that's headed our way. It's already happening around artificial intelligence and automation and how it's going to change our relationship to work, as well as to thinking and learning. And, there's this, and, and in addition, we're already using analytics and algorithms and, and that, that embed certain logics within them that lead to unintended consequences around the ways in which we use data to make decisions about who's included, who's excluded, who gets approved, who doesn't get approved, and so on. And one of the books that's influenced me, I'm putting it right now, is called Weapons of Mass Destruction. You may have heard of it. 
by Kathy O'Neill. Excuse me for speaking slowly. I think it's two L's. Um, I imagine one L. And she, her argument is exactly what I said. So let me give you a simple example. So let's say in a um, insurance company, you use actuarial tables, right? So if you're in a, a zip code where there are more accidents, you will be charged more. It has no reflect, her point is, has no reflection on whether you're a good driver or not. It's just, it's the odds. Is it right? Maybe, but maybe it isn't. In other words, her point is we should be very intentional about how we, um, how we talk about, how we think about the, the codes that we create, that we embed in the, the algorithms that we create. And Jan Elliott, hi Jan, just said that she heard her on NPR. I want you to know I talked to Kathy because I was so inspired by her work. And it's not just her work, there's many others. But I've asked her to come to a session with us sometime and she has a very busy schedule. But she is open to coming to fielding and I've been thinking about not yet summer, but maybe next winter of creating a a whole day around or half a day or and do it when alumni are there so that, you know, I think she could be a huge draw and she's very compelling. Um, and if not her, someone who's also writing in this area. And we have faculty, particularly media psych, who are really interested um, in this work. And Jan, thank you. You said it better than I did. I think it is well worth pursuing. It's hidden exclusion. And, and Kathy talks about in data, uh, any data analytics that's opaque, you know, that isn't transparent, is dangerous to democracy as well as to the social choices that we make. So I know that we're starting to lose people because we're getting close to the hour and I could talk about that all day. So I think I got almost everybody's question. I think I've got everybody. Hillary, do you see anything else? I, should I, I think so. There was quite a bit of, uh, uh, content in the chat, which I really appreciate. And we'll make sure and go through that. If you have any extra comments or questions, we'll make sure to review that and um, get back to you because we're just coming up on two o'clock. And I'm um, sorry for uh, some of the technical difficulties. It was nice to have the option of raising the hands and this is our first time doing it. And we'll work on uh, making sure that we can get that next time to get you on, um, on the sound. But I think that's it for now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, All right. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Take care, Thanks so much, Hillary. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>